Hi, everyone. I am so excited because I am speaking with author Reese Bowen again. I think this is the fourth time we've talked, Reese. But we are talking about her newest book. comes out today called The Victory Garden. Thank you so much for talking with me. Hi, Michelle. So very nice to be here. Oh, it's so fun to talk on book release day, too. I love that. You know, I'm seeing it everywhere, and I couldn't wait for this book. And every time I talk to you, I say this, but this is now my favorite book. Oh, you. really? Oh. Um, <laughs> I love what, this. You so keep raising fun. the bar for me, you know. <laughs> oh, I do keep raising the bar because I, first of all, I love your World War One and Two standalones. I love mm-hmm. your series too, but I love mm-hmm. these so much. And this one, Emily, I fell in love with Emily. I, oh, I, I just mm-hmm. got done reading it this morning. I read the final part, and I was like, I don't want to let her go. I want to keep her. <laughs> <laughs> Did you fall in love with her while writing? Oh her? yes, yeah, I, yeah. I mean, absolutely. She's, um, uh, you know, at the beginning of the book, she is really an unformed character. I think she doesn't know her own strengths. She doesn't know her own wishes, and just as you know, what happens, her, what happens to her in the book really makes her into a wonderful, strong woman by the end of it. I yeah, I think that is. My, I love watching her grow. And I, like, felt myself at 21. <laughs> yes. I, yeah. I was having – I think everybody at 21 is kind of, you know, in a lost place anyway. But she's yeah. had a particularly hard life. And, you know, but watching her grow to from the beginning, that's why at the end I was just like, oh, I want to see what happens to Emily. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I know it's only good from here. You know, she's just worked so hard and – you know, you introduced us in the beginning. Um, we start the book off in 1918, and she's yeah. writing a letter to her best friend, Clarissa. Yeah. And I, when I went back to read that letter again today, like having finished yeah. the book, it was yeah. so much more beautiful because of knowing oh. what happened. Yeah. Oh, yes. I, I suggest everybody yeah. go do that. I really do because it's, there's so much in that beginning that you give us, yeah. Yeah. you know, to start this story off. Yeah, well, you know, she's uh, she's pretty much trapped at the beginning of the book because her um, she her her young brother has um, been killed within a week of being sent out to the front in France, and the parents are so devastated that they really don't want to let go of her. She's all they've got, and so while they're um, keeping her home and not letting her go anywhere. It's not as if they're treasuring her. In many ways, she feels that they wish that it had been her and not the brother who died because he was like their golden boy. So she gets these feelings of resentment too there. So it's a very uncomfortable place for her. Mm. Yeah, I really felt for her with the parents. I mean, you know, we <laughs> I think a lot of us can say we've had tough moms, but, man, her mom yeah. was tough. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and I think both of the parents um, – reacted because of the I mean I think the mother was always a social climber and a bit of a critic and a bit of a pusher um and the father was always inclined to be strict but I think before the war there would have been that loving element and that maybe an element of fun too that had gone that had been drained from them because of their son's death yeah and you also introduced um Robbie in the first car- in the first chapter Yes, um, yeah, he's, he's Australian, part of the Royal Flying Corps, which I love because I really have never heard any stories about the Australians in World War One. So I love that you introduced us to them and what, the part that they took, because yeah. I, I don't know that everybody knows that much about it, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, Australians and New Zealanders, the, the Anzacs, as they were called, they came over they volunteered in large numbers, even though Australia is so far away and wasn't in any danger itself. They just felt this duty to the mother country to show what the colonies could do. And um, they came across in large numbers. And, of course, the first battle they had to fight was Gallipoli, which was a slaughter. Um, it was just a terrible, terrible against the Turks. And the Turks were on the heights, and um, they were sent up the beach and they literally were all mown down um so that was that was just an an awful beginning but then some of them even after that instead of saying i'm going home now they went and said what else do you need and some some of some of them joined the royal flying corps which probably was one of the most dangerous occupations because planes were so new they literally the wings were made of paper and string 
Wow. <laughs> and that's what. They, and of course, they caught fire very easily. And um, that's what ha- that's what's happened in Robbie to Robbie in the first scene is that, that he's been in the plane that's burnt. Yeah, so, and yeah, I was thinking the same thing. Like you know, we think of planes in World War Two. I mean, we have that vision yeah. of all the planes, yeah. but. In World War One, I, I mean, they were so new. It was such a new thing, and I was like, "Wow!" If we thought that watching movies with the World War Two bombers, like yeah. World War One, that was just yeah. that was an incredible, like risky thing. Like yeah. basically, they, you know, they weren't. It wasn't a good end for most pilots. <laughs> no, it wasn't, and, and and you know, it was. Uh, they didn't really know what the planes could do, so you know, you've got, of course, the famous Red Baron and the dogfights and things. But they were pushing their planes to the absolute limits. You didn't know if they could bend and twist and fly circles and things because they were so new. Mm. I just, and what I loved about this book too, when I was thinking about everything that I, because there's just so much packed into this book, is that um, I don't know how, uh, you made it so real, let's put it this way, you made it so real about what really, like how many men were lost in England and what changed everything yeah. with their businesses after. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what, one of the things that inspired me to write this book was I've always known, because um, I think growing up in England, you do know that a whole generation of men did not come back because oh. everybody I knew in England had someone who had been lost in World War One, And um, people like my aunt, who would be just the right age to be marriageable at that stage, never got married. There were an awful lot of spinsters because your chances of marriage after World War One were one in ten. There weren't any <gasps> men. And and the and the men that, that were lost like that had families and the women, yeah. you know, you, yeah. you you give us a great look at like what the women had to face without the men. Yeah. As yeah. far as feeding their families and, you know, carrying on without oh, this it was is... like a whole generation, like you said, a whole yeah. generation of well, that's oh, what made yeah. me think. What was, you know, what if there was a village in the countryside and the blacksmith didn't come back and the pub owner didn't come back and, mm. you know, any of the other heavy jobs didn't come back, who would do them? And the answer was if the women didn't do them, they wouldn't get done. If the blacksmith didn't work, then none of the carts or none of the farm equipment could be used. So, you know, it was one of those things that was uh, perform or perish, really. And, of course, that's the whole story of my book of, of Emily joining the new Women's Land Army. That, mm. that was formed towards the end of World War I because England was about to starve. There was a real danger that England would win the victory and die of starvation because there were no men to work the fields. There was no one to plant the crops. There was no one to harvest the crops. And so they rallied up this Women's Land Army. And for women, it was a huge step towards liberation because... The uniform was bloomers and a jacket, like a military jacket, and big boots. I mean, it was a very masculine uniform. And the women threw away their corsets and they cut their hair. And um, and they took a huge step towards the 20th century, which wouldn't have happened otherwise. Yeah, I love that scene with them cutting their hair because um, yeah. anybody who's seen my videos, I have extremely long hair, you know, that I uh-huh. just don't cut. And when I was reading that, I was like, let me not, I never thought, you know, for our generation, we don't think of long hair as this, like, symbol. But for them, it yeah. really was at that time. Yeah. You know, yeah. it was really yeah. a party of, like, you know, the yeah. who they could be if they weren't, yeah. like, you know, yeah. these women yeah. with long hair, you know? Yeah. Well, my favorite scene in the book is when they symbolically throw away their corsets. Oh, you know, right. one takes one takes them off and waves it around and says, "I'm not wearing this anymore," and throws it out the window, and all the others follow. That was that was fun oh. for me to to write that. Oh, yeah. that was fun. And you know, yeah. when we were talking about the men, like even the men that did survive, a yeah. lot of them were either so you know like disabled, okay, yeah. or yeah. or mentally disabled. Yeah. There's the, the one husband in the book who does come home who cries all night um, oh. and, and cries out because he can still hear the guns and everything. That was, you know, that was a very normal. In those days, they, they called it shell shock, and they didn't really acknowledge that it was a mental disease. They sort of took, took it as weakness and cowardice when that happened. Oh, that's so, so well, it, yeah, I mean, it, and you can imagine why the men... Why they why their minds snapped because 
it was just such an awful form of warfare. You know, my father served in World War II, and he was um, in the desert against Rommel, and it really was battle against battle, you know, oh. army against army. And there was a certain nobility to it. Your tanks chased Rommel's tanks, and then you fired at each other, and someone won. Um, but um, in World War One, there were these hugely... I, uh, they had a mock-up mock at an, a London mu museum a couple of years ago of a trench, and it was, well... 12 feet high at least so you're down 12 feet in this little narrow slit and of course there was so much mud in the bottom that you could hardly walk and it was damp and there were rats and um, and then they sent you over the top which is what they said and you'd go up and you'd be facing uh -huh. uh, tanks and grenades and mustard gas and everything else so it really was it was like living in hell and mm. that's why people's minds snapped I think when someone said go over the top you're some of these young men from the English countryside, their just legs said, they, "I can't do this," and then they were shot for cowardice. So it was it was an awful war. Oh, that, I, I just you know it was just so heartbreaking to read. You know, like I yeah. said, the men, you know, yeah. to know that even if the men did come back, I mean, most of the time they were disabled, and so yeah. the women again were still put in a place where they had to, you know. And then if their husbands did come back like that, it was almost an extra burden because yeah. on top of running the household, they then had to take care of them. Also. Yeah, and feed and feed you an know. extra mouth. Yeah. Yeah, feed an extra mouth. But yeah. and then I was just like, all the research you had to do for this book, because Emily, you know, and I don't want to give too much away, but she becomes, um, uh, an, I want to say like a modern day herbalist, but in her time. And yeah. I enjoyed that half of the book so much. And well, how much fun was it researching all that? Well, I think that, that, that aspect was the spark that started this whole book in that I found a book in a used bookstore and it was on herbal remedies and recipes. And um, it was a great big book and it went through recipes for everything from heart tonics to headaches to hand creams to um, uh, sweet dreams to, you know, pretty much any, anything you'd need in the medicinal line that today we just go and get a drug for. And it quoted recipes way, way back to like 1600. Um, and so I thought, oh, wouldn't it be wonderful if someone in a book sort of found a garden that could do this? And so that was my sort of driving force behind it. And of course, for, for Emily, when after a tragedy, she lands in this cottage on a big estate and she finds that the overgrown garden around it is actually the herb garden. And the person who's lived there has always taken on the role of the herb wife. And I thought, oh, she is going to heal people, the healing garden, healing people, and then through that being healed. Mm. So that was my theme of the book. Oh, I just love that. First of all, I, I love, like, <laughs> my children will tell you, like, I'm always one that I would look it up online, like, what can I make at home? before, you know, uh -huh. before going to yeah. the doctor, like, you know, yeah. and, and of yeah. course I'm not discounting because they still went to the doctor, okay? <laughs> but, yeah. but it was yeah. like, if I could find something at home, you know, that could help them before yes. taking them to a doctor, I was always for that, you know, first. Yes. And so, and, and you know, they work too. I mean, in, in, in rural settings and, and things and in other countries, lots of people are given herbs for a lot of things and they work as well as the drug does. Which really, when you you know look at it, the drug how were the drugs created? But through yeah. you know, like through that yeah. the use of those. Yeah. But Actually, um, I I did my launch party at Poison Ten in Scottsdale last night, oh. and um, and one of the women in the audience said she was she was living in Alaska a few years ago, and there was a doctor on one street corner, and the medicine man was on the street corner opposite, and everybody would go into the doctor and come out with their prescription throw away the prescription and go across <laughs> to the medicine man. <laughs> well, you know what? I always think of it as it has way less side effects because sometimes yes. you get those drugs, you know, you're like, yeah. okay, what, what worse thing could I get from the drugs? You know? <laughs> oh, like, you know, on television when you listen to when yes. you listen to those things, you know, and the side effects are, you know, nausea, vom vomiting, diarrhea, yeah. kidney failure, and death. And they say, and death very slowly. And you think... Do I want leg cramps or death? This is a yeah. 
<laughs> and you're like, oh, I have a psoriasis. I didn't know I had <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I don't know. I love that part of it. I think everybody's going to just love that part of the book. And, you know, just to be able to do the research for that. And, yes, you know, yes. and, and the way that it, it it grows Emily into realizing that she could heal people, yes. you know, what that does for her, you yes. know. And, uh, and it's just, uh, I love this book so much. <laughs> it was so good. Like I said, there's so much in it. And um, so I couldn't wait. I mean, I knew this book was coming, but I was like, I know you've got another one. Like, you've got to have another one. This is only February. So I can't imagine that you don't yeah. have another one coming out this year. Well, I've got a Royal Spinus book coming out in August. Yes. Um, I knew it. Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, I knew you. I was looking on your website, and it doesn't announce it yet. But I, no, I knew no. there had to be another one coming out. Yeah, the royal, so. the, the, yeah, the royal spinous ones always come out in August, and um, and the last few years these have come out in February. So it's, it works oh, well. That's right, because yeah, yeah, we talked about that in August. Okay, all right. Yeah. So we've, we've got yeah. a that, that's awesome for you. We've got a little yeah. pattern. <laughs> yeah, and I'm already working on the next standalone for next year. Which is going to be about Queen Victoria. So oh, uh, that's going to be fun oh, too. That's going to be incredible, especially after yeah. watching um, Victoria on, yeah. on, on. You know, like everybody loves Victoria now. You know, like yes, you, you yes. know about her. You know. Yeah. Well, the interesting thing is that I think by the time we get to next year's episodes, um, it should be about the same age as Victoria is in my book. Oh. It's about her in her later years when she spends her winters on the French Riviera. Yes. Yeah, I've read so much now about Victoria, so I, I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so tell us, the, okay, in August, what's the, do you have a title for the Royal Oh, Spine? I do, yes. Um, it takes place um, in Kenya um, on Darcy and Georgie going for their honeymoon in Kenya. And um, it's they stay in the Happy Valley, which was that area where the upper upper class Brits had created a little sort of enclave for themselves and had a lifestyle that was very dissolute um, and um, you know sex drugs and rock and roll the whole time and um, <laughs> so um, so my title is called Love and Death Among the Cheetahs oh, I can't <laughs> wait I can't wait I love the cover for Four Funerals and maybe a wedding yeah. so yeah. much that was like yeah. one of my favorite covers of that yeah. series you yeah. know so, oh, I think this one's just as good. I think it's a really lovely cover. Yes. I oh, I can't ready. wait. Yeah. Well, good. Then yeah. at least I know yeah. I'm going to talk to you yeah. again this year. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, I, I think I have to say about covers, I'm really, really blessed with my covers because... Oh, you are. They, you know, the ones for the, the Farleyfield Tuscan Child, yeah. and they, they ask me what I want, and then they send me a whole lot of different pictures and a whole lot of tonal hues and things. And, you know, we I chose this house. I said, this is the right sort of house and the cottage. And the garden, I think we need some more red in it because we have that symbol of poppies in World poppies, War One. Yeah. And, you know, so they just do all this and keep sending it back to me until I say, yes, this is the one. So that's very lucky because a lot of authors don't have any say at all on their cover. Yeah, and I do love how these covers, because uh, I'm looking at all of them while we're speaking. I'm looking at them on Amazon, and yeah. I love how your standalones, like, even though they're standalones, you can tell, like, that they are you. Uh, and, yeah, there's a brand now, right? Yeah, yeah. yes, absolutely. And the, and then the same with the, you know, the, the Royal Spinus. Uh, yeah. Those covers all have that feel to them. And, yes, right. You know, so I love that. And I actually think I'm going to try to put that up on the screen so everybody can see it because uh-huh. I love looking at covers like that, you know, so you can see yes. how they yes. all, like, are connected. And, yes. well, I, I'm so happy that I get to talk to you and read your books. It was such a blessing. <laughs> it really was. Uh, so oh, well, my pleasure. Friend. Yes, and we'll, we'll talk again in August when we've got yes. Animals Absolutely. to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, you know, good luck with everything. I'm so happy Thank to you. Get to talk on the book release day. Have so much fun out there because everybody's loving this book, and uh, yeah. I see huge things with it. So good. It's been Thank fun. you. Yeah. Okay. Have a great well, day. Well, thanks, Rachel. Michelle. Yes. You okay. too. Have a great day. Okay. Bye. Bye.